right, before I start, I want to invite everybody on television to come and visit us here at Antioch and Edgerly at 1030 on Sunday morning. I thank you for watching, but we'd love to see you here. This morning, we're going to begin in James 1.14. Let's all stand. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Father, help us today to stand on guard that Satan does not creep into our home or creep into our body, but help us to withstand his temptations, his enticements, and help us to be strong. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, the Bible said that everybody is tempted and, and enticed, and that's talking to us Christians. This isn't talking to lost people. It's talking to me and you. And I got to ask you this morning, I got to ask myself this morning, what precautions have we taken against Satan, knowing that he's coming after us to tempt us? Because he's so subtle. He can slip into your home and destroy your marriage. He can slip into your body and put you in an early grave, and you and I don't even notice he's creeping in. That's why it says in James 1.15, Then when lust has conceived, if he can make you want something that you know you shouldn't have, but he'll make you want it, it bringeth forth sin. He can make you sin by enticing you and drawing you. But the problem with that is once sin is finished with you, when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. And that's why it says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Folks, Jesus says, please don't fall for this old trick of the devil. You know the old story about a bullfrog. You can put him in a, a pot of water, turn the fire on, start warming it up, and he'll never jump out. He'll stay in that water till he gets warmer and warmer, and finally he's boiling and don't even know it. And that's how the devil is. He's subtle. He'll slip in on us. Jesus says, don't err. Don't be fooled by him. You know, Gene Lafitte said something one time. He said, you know, 50% of what we eat. Gene Lafitte was a very smart man, believe it or not. He was a Christian man at that. Gets a lot of bad publicity. He said, 50% of what we put in our mouth keeps us alive. And the other 50% is what kills us. So much truth to that. And you know, listen to what says in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many times as Christians, the devil will attack a family or attack a person or a member of that family. And, and we say, oh my God, oh this happened or that happened. But Jesus said, be aware, if you're a Christian, I'm not going to let you run with the dogs. I'm not going to let you run with the wild pigs. I'm going to bring you back into the sheepfold if i got to jerk your chain or maybe even hurt you to do it. You know the old shepherds, what they would do? They'd have a sheep. And most of the time, a sheep will stay with the herd in the protection of the shepherd. But every now and then, a sheep would wander off. Once they'd done it one time, he would continue to wander. And then usually another would follow. So what a shepherd would do is take a stick and he'd hit that sheep on a shin bone and bruise it. And it hurt, so the sheep wouldn't wander off anymore. He had a hurt leg. And a lot of times that didn't work. Well, if that didn't work, the shepherd would literally fracture the leg, not break it and compound it, but actually crack the bone to cripple it because it would be better if it had three legs than to go off and get eaten by a wolf in the wilderness. And, of course, folks, if that didn't work, the sheep went to the slaughterhouse. And you and I are the same way, and Jesus tells us that. He will try to curve your appetite for sin. He'll try to get you to break them bad habits that half of us don't even realize we're doing. And if that don't work, he'll let you go to the graveyard and take you on to glory because you can't control your flesh. It's a serious matter. That's why he says, don't err, my beloved brethren. But you know, y'all, sometimes we get cocky and we think we got everything under control. We've been saved a long time and we're pretty strong. And we'll probably want to dabble with sin. Want to let a little bit of it in until, you know, we get enough and then we shut it off. But listen good. You're glorying. And pro listen what this says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. <clears throat> Your glorying is not good. What that means is too much self-confidence. You and I cannot get so self-confident we think we can play with the devil. Because, y'all, if he can get a foot in the door, listen. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, I know you ladies, you bake bread, and you know what this is talking about. A lot of us men don't know what this means. 
But you can take some dough and water and, you know, make you some flour and make you a biscuit. And it'll just sit there and it won't change a bit. But man, you can just take a little pinch of yeast, I mean nothing, and mix it in there and after all that thing will be this big because the yeast grows. And Jesus is trying to tell us today that a little leaven, a little bit of yeast in your life can make a sin grow to where you can't control it anymore. I've seen people make a mistake and put too much yeast in their bread and it would push the oven door open. Well, folks, I can tell you, you let that sin in your life and it'll grow and it'll stretch and it'll spread until you're busting at the seams with sin and it'll destroy you and it's subtle. We've got to be so careful because you see, and I know you're going to say, boy, Brother Russell, you use that verse too much. Proverbs 117. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. You know, y'all, it's so true. You cannot set a trap for an animal without him not knowing it's a trap. I mean, if an animal knows it's a trap, he's not going to go in it. But we go through all kinds of trouble. You wash the trap and get your scent off of it, and you hide it, put grass on top of it, or whatever you got to do. But if you set a trap for an animal and he can see it's a trap, he's not going to go in it. And I'm going to tell you right now, the devil is not going to tell you ahead of time, oh, you're going to be an alcoholic, oh, you're going to have emphysema, oh, you're going to... He's not going to tell you that stuff. He's going to lure you in slowly until he can get you where you have no control anymore. You're either addicted or you're hooked or it's so habit-forming, it's got you. And, you know, folks, we do so much that hurts us. You know, I mean, there's so many things that are so harmful to us, and yet we do it anyway. Eating donuts, fried, and hog fat, that's real nutritious. That's real good for us. But we all do these things, you know. You know yourself that anything wrapped in bacon tastes better, don't it? It don't matter what it is. You wrap a piece of bacon around and it tastes good because it's deadly. <laughs> anything, anything. Hey, an old man told me he had a heart condition and the doctor told him, what you have to do when you put something in your mouth, if it tastes good, spit it out immediately. And that's the truth. That's about how it works. But you know, folks, addictions, there are just so many of them that haunt us and plague us. But the Bible says, don't go in that trap. Be warned that Satan is the trickster. He's the lurer, and once he lures you in. But this is what you're supposed to do. Listen to this good. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. You see, folks, we're supposed to be unleavened bread. That's why in the Passover, the bread didn't have yeast in it. It was flat bread because that yeast represents sin. And Jesus is telling you and I today, purge out that old sin. And I know that every one of us in here, we still got old sins that we haven't completely got rid of. If you like to do stuff when you were lost and it was hurting you, chances are you still like to do it. Maybe you've curved it and you've cut back on it, and those are all great. But we need to be aware that the devil wants to put you in an early grave. And like it said, when that old sin is finished, that's where you'll wind up. Man, we've got to purge it out. We've got to get our lives cleaned up. And, you know, you and I, we know what's good and what's not good. We can make ourselves believe it's okay and and a lot of things in, in moderation are okay. But you know when you're going overboard. Like I said, I, there's nothing wrong with a Dr. Pepper, but I know people that drink a whole case a day. And you cannot tell me that's good. You know? But you know what? Listen, y'all. Here is the key to all of 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you and I and our heart feels like it's evil, then leave it alone. Well, how do you know? Well, you know, I look at it this way. Anything I can't say no to, then it's got control over me, and that makes it evil. We've got to be able to say no to something to prove to ourselves that it doesn't have us, or else we're addicted. We're hooked, habit-forming. That's what we need to work on today. And here's the reason why, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, you, God, God, I, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, 
God wants us to be pure for him. Every time there's something you want to do and you know you really shouldn't and you abstain, you make God smile because God knows you're doing that for him. We do so little for God, and he does so much for us. It's almost a shame that we don't strive to do a little more for him, huh? But you know, today, there are so many religious people that go to church, but they live like the rest of the world. Folks, that's not how it's supposed to be. It ain't just coming to church. It's setting ourselves apart from the rest of the world. When we see the world doing destructive things that's destroying families, destroying their health, destroying their marriages, destroying their lives, we've got to be able to say no to these things. And you know what? And here's the problem with the world today in 2 Timothy 3, 5. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof from such turn away. Folks, it's one thing to believe in God, but it's another thing to live for God. And if you believe in God, it's not going to do you a bit of good when, if you're not living for Him. Because living for Him is what gives us a strong prayer life. Living for Him is what purges out the sinful world's habits. We must live for God. <coughs> Today, there's so much against us. Our kids, they've got all these computer games and all this stuff. And the adults got the internet bringing garbage into their home. They can't have, the men can't resist and... It's just, it's just one thing after another. Our women are being brainwashed by the television set and trying to make them be men and trying to make them hate men. They hate them. That, that's what gets, we're not supposed to hate one another. By nature, we're to love each other. But the TV, it's, it's brainwashed. That's why it says in 2 Timothy 3, 6, For this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away of the diverse lust. Well, folks, I, I hate to say it, but it's not just women today. There's some silly people in this world today. You can make them believe anything. And I'm sorry, but you can pretend something's true, and that don't make it true at all. Today in America, we are so lied to, and the people believe that killing unborn babies ain't a thing in the world wrong with that. They actually believe it's just old worthless tissue. You know something, if they can make people believe like that, they really are silly people to believe that. But yet, they do. Folks, I've got to remind you today, you're saved. And if you're really saved by the blood of the Lamb, you're bought with a price. And you can't go to hell because you belong to God. He bought you with His blood. But boy, you can turn your life into a living hell on this earth if you don't walk with God. I've noticed so many times, people, that their life is a living hell. And I try to counsel them. I try to help them. But it don't take me long to figure something out. They bring it on themselves. So many times they bring it on themselves. And oh, poor pitiful me. Could you help me? I'm broke again this week. Could you give me some money? No, no, because you're bringing this on yourself. And you need to stand up on your own two feet, dust yourself off, and remind yourself that God bought your soul. You need to live for God. We owe him at least that much. And that's why this Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Folks, you belong to God. You need to start living that way. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And when you put poison in it that distorts the brain or just is not good for you, then you're messing with the temple of the Holy Ghost. And God flat out says he'll put you in a graveyard if you do that. Folks, we need to be aware of that. For you are bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 7, 23. Be not servants of men. Folks, we're not supposed to act like the rest of the world. Let the world do what they want to do. But we're not supposed to be that way. It's something today how good is evil and evil is good. And you see it everywhere you look. Oh, you know what? James 4, 7 is the ticket. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You see, folks, you'd be surprised if you'd resist the devil in the name of Jesus, how you'd get power and victory over habits you and I are trying to break. 
And I mean, there's just so many, so many. You know, when you say something like that, people are like, thinking cocaine or alcoholism. Or, no, folks, we do stuff that so much coffee we drink and so much stuff that's junk and we put in our body and the, and the sugar. My goodness, we eat so much sugar in America. It's unreal. They're just so many. And, and you know what else? Just being flat out lazy. Sitting in that chair all the time and not doing nothing. Man, that's devastating for your body. You ought to have a little exercise program. And above all, you ought to have exercise for your spirit. Read your Bible every day. Get up and do something for the glory of God. But you know what? Here's the ticket in Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know what? I've known so many people that would get saved and quit smoking and two years later start smoking again. I've seen that so many times. Bless their hearts. They try and they fight it as long as they can, but that old craving never goes away. And before you know it, they get entangled with it again. Folks, if Jesus has freed you from a habit, don't get entangled with that again. Don't think, well, I'll just have a little bit. and I, It don't work that way. Yeah, I'll tell you something. For the Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know, that flat out says it. You're not always going to have victory. We're going to succumb to sin sometime. We're going to have a weak moment sometime. You might make up your mind you're not going to do that anymore or you're going to do this when you're supposed to. But on Sunday morning, you're just so sleepy and tired from all week being beat down and you don't feel good and you blow church off. That's how we do. It's, just, it's a constant cycle with us. We're going to make up our mind to do the right thing from now on. But when the rubber hits the road, sometimes it just don't happen that way. And it's sad. We need to work on it. You know, folks, the thing about it is, is so many times we'll give up something. And I know in my own case, like if, if I make up my mind, I'm going to start eating right. And I, I, and I do. And I do real well. And after about a month, y'all, I'm so hungry for a big old greasy hamburger. So I'd almost kill a man to get one. And then when I go ahead and I have that greasy hamburger, it's so good, I go ahead and have a big old hot dog after that. And then it's over with. It's over with. I'm, I'm like a shark in the Gulf of Mexico in a feeding frenzy, and I gain all my weight back. The Bible teaches us this, that when you try to break a habit and you abstain for a while, be on your guard. Because as soon as you let your guard down, that demon of hunger or whatever you want to call it, no, demon of greed. I tell my wife, I'm hungry. No, you're not. You're greedy. <laughs> I hear that every night about 9 o'clock. You can't be hungry. You can't be. You're greedy. Well, I guess that's true. But it sure would feel good to have a, a donut go down my gullet about that time. But you know, listen, when you chase them demons out of your body, folks, listen here. Listen what this says. Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. All right, first of all, a demon is a parasite. You are the host. Just like a tick on a dog's ear. That tick falls off that ear, he's got to find him another ear or he's in trouble. You, you know ticks don't walk very good. Their little legs ain't that long. They got to be on an animal to carry them around. They can't just go out and get a meal. They got to wait for something to come by and get on it and take a ride. And you know, folks, the demons are the same way. When you pick the demons off of your ears, they have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to rest and they're waiting for somebody else to come along. These demons will go into dry places, it says. No other places where they can't destroy no one's life. Demons are the devil's workers. Their job is to destroy you. And you know what that demon does? He'll go off and wander around until he runs into some other demons. Because there's a bunch of them been kicked out. A lot of them kill the host, and they got to get out. And then they get to talking. Oh, yeah, I was in an alcoholic. Oh, he got drunk, whipped his wife every night. We had a blast. And another one would be talking, and, yeah, man, he smoked so much he couldn't even have a conversation without coughing. And they'd get to talking. 
And you know what happens? One of them says, well, I've been gone six months, and I know this old boy's starving to death for something that'll kill him. I'm going to go over right now and see if I can't get back in. And the other demon said, hey, we'll go with you. And then the demons go with him, and guess what? Boy, that evening you are just super whatever you need to be to invite them in, okay? I'm just saying you got a craving like you ain't had in a year. Let me read this to you. When an unclean spirit is going out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, finding none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Man, he comes back and you're all cleaned up and shaved and got on clean clothes. You've been eating healthy and you got a good color back to your face. Man, you got a spring in your step. Oh, what a trophy for a demon to kill. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so, you it be also this wicked generation. Folks, we are living in a wicked generation. And be aware, demons are real. I know today they try to make it look like demons or, or fables or just fairy tales. They are real beings. And they hate you. And they want to kill you. And kill your kids. Kill your family. But we have the ability to say no. You see, folks, I can do anything I want because I'm saved. Now, I know that sounds terrible. But I'm saved. And there's nothing can send me to hell because I'm bought. I had a man in this church one time years back come and he asked me, Brother Russell, if I drink a beer, will it send me to hell? No, not getting saved will send you to hell. Drinking a beer won't send you to hell. But not getting saved will. And you know, folks, I want to show you what Apostle Paul says about this. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Paul said, I can do anything because I'm bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb, but it ain't good for me. I'm not fooling nobody. I know I can, I can do things and still go to heaven, but it ain't good for my life. It ain't good for my walk with God. It ain't good for my health. It's not good for my marriage. All things in 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Plain and simple. You're saved and you're going to heaven, not because you're good. You never were. You never will be. But Jesus saved you because you asked him to through faith, and he saved you. But that will not keep you out of prison if you rob a store. It will not keep you from emphysema. It will not keep you from cirrhosis of the liver. It will not protect you from hep C. Folks, you get out in that world and get to playing around, and you wind up with AIDS or some kind of deadly disease. God says, I've saved you, but you better walk clean and you better live right because if you don't, there's consequences to pay. And you know what this says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. This is talking about being part of a church. You see, back in the Bible days, they fed people when they came to church. They literally did the Lord's Supper every time they met. And they said, as you eat this bread and feed your flesh, think about your hungry spirit. As you drink this cup of juice and quench your thirst, think about your soul that's thirsting for something. It's Jesus it's thirsting for. And they did it. Well, a lot of people would come to church just for a free meal. They'd come eat the bread and drink the grape juice, but they didn't have no interest in God. They'd go through the motions to get a free meal. We still see that to this very day. You know, you can't hardly fill this church up, but you announce we're having a belly stretching with fried chicken and cake and see if we don't have a full church that Sunday because people do that. They still do it. But listen what this says. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We are the body of Christ. We don't come here to fill our bellies and get a free meal. We come here to get full of the Holy Spirit and get victory in life and guidance and wisdom. That's what we come to church for, not to get a free meal, but people do it. 
And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That sleep means graveyard, folks, because people are coming to church, and they really don't have Jesus. Or maybe they have Jesus, but they're not getting nothing out of church because they're too caught up in the world. Like I said, God will jerk your chain. And hopefully when he jerks my chain, I listen. Because if he don't get my attention, he will get my attention or he'll put me in shady acres. Amen? Amen. Well, as we go on, 1 Corinthians 11.31 is such good advice. For if we would judge ourselves... We should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Plain and simple. God's not going to let you act like the rest of the world. Oh, I know these football players that are professionals. They make $100 million a year and they're snorting cocaine and smoking crack and chasing prostitutes and, and God lets them get away. That's because they're lost. You're not going to do that. God's not going to let you do that. You are the body of Christ. You are a child of God. And just like you, you love your kids. And if you see them going astray, you're going to jerk that rope. Well, God's going to do the same for you. He loves you. And he's not going to let you be destroyed with the rest of the world. So the best thing you and I can do is examine ourselves. Make sure we're real. Make sure you really are praying and not just moving your lips. When you open that songbook and you sing them hymns, make sure you're singing to the one that you love, not just going through the motions because we're in church. And when it comes from abstaining from evil, don't be like the rest of the world, a dead fish floating with a tide. Swim upstream where there's life and food and prosperity. Be strong for God and say no and abstain from evil. Your life will be so much better for it and so much longer for it. Well... There's a little story in the Bible about Jesus going up to a fig tree. He had been traveling, and boy, he was hungry. He was tired. <clears throat> and he saw a fig tree way off in the distance one day. He told the apostles, he said, I'm going to get off the trail a minute. I'm going to walk out there and get me a handful of them figs. They ain't eight in days. And Jesus walked all the way out there, and when he got there, it was a pretty fig tree. didn't have a fig on it. Just like some people come to church with their suit and their tie and their Bible under their arm, but they ain't never bore no fruit of any kind. Folks, do you bear fruit for God? Well, I'm just not the type to be a preacher. You ain't got to be a preacher to bear fruit. You can be a faithful church member that comes to this church every Sunday morning praying, prayed up, and ready to do business with God. You can be a prayer warrior and pray for people that are sick or people that are in need. That's how you bear fruit. Not everybody's a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody's a musician. Not everybody's a preacher. But you've got a talent God has given you. It might be simply to witness to your mama and get her saved. A witness to an old uncle that's all alone and get him to know the Lord. We all got a ministry, folks. But you need to search yourself and find what your ministry is and do it. You know what? We wouldn't have no lights on right now if you folks didn't tithe and take care of this little church. We've all got a part to do and we do it. That's why we're successful. But you know what? Listen to what the Bible says, Matthew 21, 18, a little story, true story. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. Man, Jesus was hungry. When he saw a fig tree and the way he came to it, and he found nothing thereon but leaves only. And he said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently, immediately, the fig tree withered away. You know something, folks? He told that fig tree, you want to pretend to be a fig tree? Folks, you're not a fig tree till you make a fig. You're not a tomato bush until you produce a tomato. And you're not a Christian until you bear fruit. And I hope every one of us can say, well, I, I never led nobody to the Lord, but I did bring comfort to someone that was bereaved. Or I have led people to the Lord. Or, or I have witnessed. Or, You've got a job to do. And you and I better start bearing fruit because Jesus don't like it when he goes up to the fig tree. There's nothing on it but leaves. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Well, that's because God wanted them to see. He don't put up with our slothfulness and our, our 
pretend Christianity. You know, folks, the Bible tells it to us like this. This whole world is a, like a thorn bed. God planted a good seed in you. And he wants you to grow up to be happy, prosperous, victorious. He wants you to have joy in your life and raise your family in Christ where we can all be so productive and God will be so proud of us. And one day, the ultimate goal is to walk through the gates made of pearl, standing on a street made of gold with all those that you love around you and hugging you and congratulating you that you made it to heaven. That's our, our finished goal. But listen what Luke 8, 14 says. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares of riches, the cares and riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Folks, Jesus said we get so caught up in the world, so caught up in trying to be a millionaire, so caught up in whatever it may be that we get to where we're not productive for Christ anymore. To you and I, that don't sound like much, but to that fig tree, it realizes it means a lot. Again, some fell in Mark 4, 7 among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Folks, to put it simple, if you live like the world, you will not be pleasing to God. If there's no different from you and the lost, then you're no different in the eyes of God. That's why this Bible tells us right here, Romans 8, 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Folks, if you say no to your body, when it wants something that you know you shouldn't do, or when it won't get up out of bed and go to church when you know you should do. If you let that flesh rule over you, you're going to live a short, unhappy life. But if you let Christ guide you, and you do what's right, like the little bracelet people wear, what would Jesus do? Always ask yourself, what would Jesus do? That'll answer it every time. And the Bible, I'm going to close with this. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I've had people tell me, oh, I can sin and it don't bother me a bit. Well, that's because you lost it on the road to hell. If you've been saved, it's going to bug you when you fail God. If you've been saved, it's going to bug you when you don't come to church. If you can miss church and it don't bother you, you ought to feel guilty all day long Sunday and your week ought to be lousy if you don't start it out with God. That's how you know you're a Christian. But folks, today I'm just going to close with this. You can be saved <coughs> and you can know your Bible, but if you don't apply it to your life, you're not going to get anything out of it when it comes to victory and prosperity, comfort and peace. When my day comes and I close my eyes in death, I want to leave this world with confidence knowing that God's pleased with what I've done. And I think you and I should all be striving for that, if nothing else in the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word today. Lord, you're so good about warning us and tipping us off and letting us know ahead of time before we get destroyed by the devil. Father, help us to say no to things that shouldn't touch our lips. Help us to say yes to the things that you require of us. And help us to care and have compassion. Help us to pray for those that are in need of prayer. And Lord God, just use us in every way you can that, Lord, we would be useful to you. We thank you so much that Jesus has bought us with a price. And we belong to you, no doings of our own except faithfully calling upon you but Lord you paid the price and you've bought us and we're yours help us to live up to that standard and help us to be worthy of the calling in which you have called upon us to serve you bless us all now if there's one lost let them come get saved now and let us Christians who are saved help us to abstain from evil and walk close by your side 
In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Everyone, please.